So we've been talking about a lot of things today, but if we could just start out. Um, you know, you are known for your rights-based approach to development. And obviously, the right to a job is a laudable goal, and we all want to work towards that. But on the road there, how do you think you can use some of the recommendations or the research and communications from Recom to help make that goal a reality? Well, let me first say that I'm also very pleased to be here, and I put a lot of emphasis on getting here, which was impossible uh, according to the schedule, because we have the Global Green Growth Forum in town as well, as, as you know, and, uh, and heaps of uh, visitors there. But I played great emphasis in coming here because I think Recom is a very inspiring exercise. I really value the input, the uh, analysis that we get. Uh, and I have even at some point participated a little bit. I don't know whether, Finn, have you cancelled my contract when I became a minister? <laughs> <laughs> if not, then I'm still on the employers list of Recom. Anyway, but, uh, but it's, so it's a privilege to be here. Every people, every person in the world has a right to decent occupation. Uh, and, and I think that is something to, to, to kind of insist on and, 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 and be a little bit firm on that this, because not to say that it's an easily uh, achievable goal, uh, because it is not, and we can say that in Europe, we can see it in Denmark, uh, and we can see it uh, in Africa, and the World Developing Development Report now gives us shocking figures on how bad it is in many parts of the, of the world. So it's not because it's an, it, 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 it do, does the trick, but it puts an obligation on all of us to do our utmost to create those jobs and decent uh, jobs and good jobs and green jobs in order to make sure that we can at least work towards fulfilling this uh, right uh, uh, to uh, occupation to decent uh, jobs. Uh, so, so that's why a rights-based approach even here, and it is a right, uh, is, is, an, is a valuable starting point. Now, now, it's not to say that it's, it's easy, but I think the research here gives us, uh, I can't say I've read all of it, but I have read the, some of the <coughs> summaries, and the research, uh, it, when I read it, it gave me a little bit of flashback to the 1973 ILO report, uh, on where we back then, of course, believed that if we just got the, the formal market to work, then everything would be fine, and we forgot the informal markets. And I think this dynamics uh, that is uh, also uh, very much described in the, in the research here is an important one to, uh, to, to look at. Job creation is keen uh, to our uh, strategy uh, for development cooperation, uh, and, uh, and it is so for those very reasons that are stressed in the research here, how job creation is absolutely essential to create uh, stable societies. Having just been to Egypt, where they need a million jobs a year uh, in order uh, to do something with uh, 700,000 jobs just to cope with uh, in, uh, the, the, the new generations moving into the job market and 300,000 to do a little bit with unemployment. A million jobs a year. And if you don't do it, the instability that this can cause to a country uh, as Egypt now can be potentially extremely damaging. And these are the people who will go to Tahir Square again very soon. Um, so I think uh, putting more emphasis on creating tools <coughs> within our development cooperation that can alleviate poverty but create jobs and growth at the same time, I think is, is what is inspiring with the research and that's what we need to know more about. Well, you know, the, 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 the thing that got me excited just as a moderator was the whole concept of having the research and the communication, but also the focus on results that you can, news you can use. I know you have a journalistic past as well. Um, but I'm, I'm just curious because, you know, one of the things you've said about job creation and working with the private sector, and of course, Denmark has been a pioneer, and that's something that we've touched on during the day. Um, how do you see that moving forward? Because you have quite a few successful sort of cooperations that go from all kinds of levels through uh, the, 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 the uh, small and medium-sized employers up through Danita and mega funds that we heard about earlier today. So how will you be using some of these results to sort of project your, or form your policy later on? Well, that's what I'm here to listen uh, and, 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 and learn uh, exactly how can you advise us to go on, because I think we have a true dilemma here. We have many projects, micro projects also, that really showcase how it can be done. You know, 
I've visited this flower production plant in Kenya, where we have used the NIDA uh, business partnerships uh, to form an alliance between a Danish uh, uh, flower production plant and a Kenyan one. They now will reach 150 new employees in Kenya, and they have added to the staff list in Denmark as well. Uh, and an innovative partnership, it's good jobs because the women stand up when they do their flowers and they don't crawl on their knees as they do in most other plants in Kenya. It's green jobs uh, because they use integrated pest management. And this is an inspirational thing. And, uh, and I think it's worthwhile the investment, but it's 150 jobs, you know, and how do we reach uh, 17 million jobs in, 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 uh, in, uh, in, in Africa as such. So how do we then bridge that with policy changes? Uh, that can really promote a conducive environment. And then how do you add in investment uh, 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 tools that can bring in the necessary investment? And I think we need to focus more on both those uh, levels in our uh, partnerships and our job creation efforts. Uh, uh, there are so many barriers uh, still uh, to job creation in, in Africa. We are trying to put focus on an important part of it, in promoting a new doing agriculture index, as it was called. Uh, yeah, you just you, you it, jumped ahead of me because I was about to ask you about that. But because see, that please was elaborate. In, because I, I really, you know, being a farmer myself, uh, and that's also why I can't use this hand. <laughs> uh, but being a farmer myself, I know, a, 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 and an economist as well by profession, the, the agricultural policy you see in many African countries is still way from creating the environment that will really allow farmers to engage and agribusiness to develop. And we need to put clear cut focus on exactly that. And an agribusiness doing agriculture index can help us because it puts a spotlight on the policies that need to be changed in order to promote employment. And there are no, there's no other sector than agriculture that can create so many jobs uh, and agribusiness has a huge potential in Africa. So here we try to create new tools and put a spotlight on the policies that are uh, again, that working against uh, employment creation in, in the agricultural sector uh, as such. So that's, that's one example. Uh, it will be a small investment, but if it can create the change that I think the doing business index have done in many countries, then it's going to be worth the while. Well, you actually have repeated one of the things that's come up very much today in terms of supporting agricultural productivity at different levels going up the chain. And also we were touching on the aid trade complementarity. I mean, is that something that you have a resonance with? I'm, I'm not asking you to tell us what policies you are going to make because obviously you, you know, we're not at that stage yet. But, but how does all this information filter through to you? And, and talking to, obviously, people who are here and um, just using the kind of information that's coming because there's been an amazing uh, conversation going on in this room today. And, you know, now you're a part of it. So I think we, we, we want to hear without specifics but just how but you see things going forward. No, but aid, aid and trade is a, is a critical link. And we do that as well, East African community. We support uh, the integration of markets in the East African community. We help to lower formal trade barriers. We help to develop quality uh, or joint standards that can enlarge the markets because uh, having been a trade economist as well, you know, this uh, market size matters a lot in job creation and in attracting investments uh, is absolutely crucial with market size. So East African community integration is one good example where we work with Trademark East Africa and on the very concrete uh, engagement that can help uh, build bigger markets and thereby promote investments and employment. Uh, investment Promotion as such is something that we are looking more and more at, trying to find innovative financing modalities uh, that can multiply our development finance. Uh, that's absolutely uh, uh, crucial as well, uh, because we know very well that development finance is going to be a small part of the overall financial flows that we need in order to promote green growth and decent employment. Um, so how can we use development finance to multiply total investments in Africa, for instance. And the way to do it, I guess, is that the public finance, as we've done it, 
in many occasions, has to take a little part of the risk, help to identify the projects, and then put in pension funds as additional investors and private companies on top of that. We do that with the Investment Fund for Developing Countries, uh, uh, IFU in Denmark. Uh, we do it internationally with more and more instruments that work in this manner. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's the very necessary way to do it. You see it in climate finance. It comes in big scale as well, uh, this working modality. Uh, and uh, and uh, because obviously it's difficult to attract investors in many African or developing countries because the risk is a little bit higher and the projects are more difficult to identify. Can we solve those two problems? I'm sure the investments will follow suit. Well, we actually had um, um, Hans, uh, Niels Tussen here this morning, uh, who was instrumental with Bank Invest at the beginning, and they ended up investing in Vietnam. And he said there is no way they would have done it without Danita actually taking part. And Danita only put one tenth of of the, the funds in, so that was a pretty good yeah. kind of uh, partnership to go forward. Um, you know, one of the things, and you echo each other, uh, Eve and you, in terms of this concept of aid as a catalyst. And I'm just wondering how you see that development going on. And I know that all donors like to think of the fact that it's not going to be an endless process, that there will be, let's not just say an exit strategy, but a transition strategy. And how do you think the two can actually fit together to make that happen, obviously working with your partners in the recipient countries? Well, how it can fit together in the... <laughs> uh, no, what I'm saying is... Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not being clear, so I, I take responsibility for that. But this concept of aid as a catalyst, yeah, yeah. and how then you get things to move forward so that you can actually look at a transfer, transformation policy and then ultimately an exit strategy, because it's not something that should be an endless black hole. No, no, it, it, it shouldn't, uh, for sure. Uh, and uh, and I think, uh, I think it, that the numerous examples of where it, it actually does uh, fit together and where you manage to upgrade countries um, overall business environment that attracts investments how we increasingly focus on creating uh, taxation or uh, building taxation systems and revenue systems that can lead to uh, independence of, of nations uh, and, uh, and I think that transition is 10 years ago, we had almost no countries we could point to and say, here, well, it actually worked. But I think more and more they are coming in, they are standing in line, actually, to uh, engage in this transformation. And I think that's also why the, the policy level becomes much more important. And now we engage in sustainable energy for all, for instance, a big global initiative in order to create access to energy, improve energy efficiency, and promote renewable energy. The three goals set out by the uh, Secretary General in his Sustainable Energy for All initiative. How do you do it? Well, the way they do it is actually they take, there will be probably 100 pilot countries, and then you group them. Here you have a group, they are ready for investments. They have the conducive environment, they ha have investment rules in place, they have energy policies that, are, that can promote investments in, in, in energy and, and, and clean energy. Here we are, what to do then? Well, you go for the next step, that's project identification, and then it's uh, uh, gathering together investment uh, packages. Uh, it, it will be the World Bank, the EIB, the IFU, it will be private companies, uh, putting in those big scale investment packages and moving those countries to the next level. That's the ready countries. Then you have countries where you lack policies, where you uh, haven't got the, the right framework for investments, where you don't have energy uh, uh, policies or prices that are conducive for investments, you work on those obstacles. And then you have the really perhaps bottom of the pyramid uh, countries uh, where you need to do a lot more in order you can uh, achieve that transformation. But I think if you go back, you know, uh, much of this uh, a few years ago, it was in the wake and it was, uh, it was uh, uh, still uh, not very clear. I think there's a much more, I said, the sustainable energy for all shows us now a, a much more focused attempt to move countries at various stages of their development pathway uh, to the next step and engaging with all the kind of different tools that we need. Here we need investment packages, here we need project identification, here we need um, uh, policy environments to change, uh, and here we need infrastructure to be built.
And I think that we are much more systematic, I guess, than we have been before. And that question, by the way, was not a criticism. That was actually laudatory because you're, uh, you're doing well. I, 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 I guess I'm coming across as aggressive. aggressive. I've been so sweet yeah. to everybody yeah. else all day. <laughs> um, I believe in a rights-based approach, you know, you have to keep me accountable. Uh -huh. uh. Um, but just one last thing before I, I um, start letting other people ask you questions. But, uh, you know, the one thing, I mean, Denmark, it, this was the home of Recom because it started here. But the one, there have been a number of themes we've heard repeated over and over and over today. But the need for more data is one that keeps coming up, that we just do not have the information we need. And do you think, I mean, you're already investing in recom, but do you think that this is something, because there's no immediate return. If you're a politician, you know, you have to sort of be accountable to your constituents all the time. How do you sell the need to invest in something like research to your constituents, to your government, to your organizations? And I'm assuming you think it's important because you're already supporting Recom. I'm, I'm making an assumption, and if I'm wrong, just sort of bat me over the head virtually. But, but I think knowledge is absolutely crucial. Well, uh, some years back, uh, I, I had lunch with uh, Shanta Devarajan, who many of you uh, know, uh, the African director of the World Bank. Uh, and he said to me, now, uh, now for years, you know, he had been sitting next to African statesmen, whispering into their ears what they should do and trying to give them good advice on how they could adjust and, uh, and promote projects in order to create change. And he said, especially that part about sitting next to a president whispering into his ears, he would never do it again. He was finished, end of story, he would never do it again because he said it doesn't work. It only works if you get the right constituency working inside the country. And how do you do it? Well, he said, I do good research. I do good analysis. And if I can do good analysis, and then I insist from the very beginning that I'll disseminate it to everybody. I'll send it out. I will fly in with a chopper and distribute it all over the country. And then when people pick it up, they will say, look at this. We could do better. We could do differently. Uh, uh, we could improve. Um, and with that as a tool, you can create change. And that is very much a rights-based strategy as well. Information is everything, you know. And I, that's why we invest in research. And that's why we invest in information. Uh, and that's why I expect and haven't read the studies yet, haven't heard to the good discussion, which I look forward to uh, getting uh, uh, Ip to uh, translate to me uh, when we can sit down now and hopefully uh, look at this seminar and say, what did we learn from here? Then we will fly choppers all over Africa and disseminate it uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and spread it out. And that's going to create change. So that's why we invest uh, and that's why we uh, engage with the researchers. And, and, and having been at the university for many years, working with Finn and under his great leadership at the University of Copenhagen, um, it has only made me even more determined to do good research, good analysis and create change by, by, by promoting it. Great. Now, I don't know if you're more comfortable sitting down or standing up. You may I'll join take the panel now. Fine. And then, uh, but I'm, I think there are probably a couple of questions that people might have. And you have one of these little voting machines. Um, oh. Except I haven't had time to explain to you how to do it. Johnny will give you a, a quick lesson. <laughs> All right, folks. Um, and this includes the panel. We're getting into wrap-up time, but also, do we have any questions? Uh, it's not every day you get to ask the minister a question. So why do, I'm going to start with um, Mr. Gonzalo Cid. Gonzalo? Here. Donde esta? OK. Um, well, uh, I come from South America. And I want to start my question with uh, a statement that we have in South America. Because we are close of this date. Um, in October 12th of 1492, the indigenous of South America realized that we were poor and we were naked. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm st starting with this uh, because we are been talking about development. And in South America, indigenous culture doesn't want development as the occidental view. OK, Gonzalo? You, you want, uh, Gonzalo? Yeah, One the, sec, slowly. Nobody can understand a word you're saying. OK. In South America, uh, indigenous culture doesn't want the development at the occidental view. Uh, 
The, the difference is uh, how to create the right development policy when the pressure of the world for growing goes against the will of the population and indigenous uh, for achieve a different kind of development. I say this in the context uh, in all across South America, uh, indigenous are being moved uh, because they are in the land or where the water is available for mining, minery, and for electric generation. And they are getting moved because an economic factor. Okay, Gonzalo, thank you. I'm sorry that I think everybody will have taken that on board. Um, Astrid, I'm gonna miss your second name, Lund Anderson. Astrid. Yes, um, hello. Um, I would just like to know um, how um, you find a balance between the fact that development takes a lot of time. Um, like Johnny mentioned, he both mentioned um, Grundvi and Napoleon. So our uh, development is a product of many years. Um, and then the fact that you're a part of a government who only sits for four years and therefore needs um, quick results in order to gain success. Um, Re-election. <laughs> yes, but only if you're successful. Hey. Well, uh, first, uh, on the, the, the question on the indigenous people uh, being skeptical about growth as we might see it in our part of the world, I think it's a valid uh, point, and I, I have been uh, um, discussing it, uh, of course, also uh, when I went to Bolivia and with Morales, and you know, there, there are, of course, some different notions of growth here that needs to be understood. But I have also stood with indigenous people and the uh, Altiplano of, uh, of Bolivia and seeing their aspirations to have a better life and, uh, and, and improving their income and, and earning a better uh, uh, income on producing quinoa for world markets. And so, so I'm not quite sure and that it can't be, you can't see a bridge uh, between indigenous peoples of course, rights, their cultural uh, heritage, uh, their aspirations to live uh, with a greater respect for nature than what we have done in our part of the world, and then a green growth pattern where you actually create better living conditions and more employment. I think it can be bridged, uh, but I do understand that there are sensitivities in doing so, and, and for sure. Also, in global uh, discussions on everything from climate change to green growth, we see these differences popping up. Uh, but I think there are ways, especially within a green growth strategy, uh, where you can uh, have these different aspects of a growth pattern to come together. How do you do long-term planning when you have short-term elections? Uh, I think that was the question, uh, wasn't it? Uh, it's basically, if you're a politician and you're in for four years, how do you make plans that might need 10? How do you balance the, the long-term needs of development with the short-term needs of getting re-elected? Yeah, well, I've said from the very beginning that I, 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 my intention is to stick for 16 years. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I know it's, uh, it is difficult. Uh, and, and of course, I, I see the dilemma constantly uh, in my daily work because uh, you, know, I, you need to be... Uh, uh, my job is uh, outside and uh, the voters are in Denmark, so in a very practical sense, uh, I, I have the dilemma on my um, uh, daily uh, work. But I, and, and I, I, I do uh, reckon that it is difficult also because, and you can see this government, right? What did we say from the beginning? We, and you heard the discussions, we said from the very beginning that we were looking at 2020, the long-term reforms, the long-term perspective. That was the vision of this government coming into office. And have we been, have the voters reacted positive to that vision? Uh, well, no, <laughs> uh, you, can't <laughs> <laughs> you can't say so. So our kind of attempt to do long-term thinking and reforms for 2020 came, didn't come out well uh, with Danish voters, for sure. And now, uh, if I'm sure uh, for the next year or so, you'll hear everybody talking about tomorrow, uh, even today, uh, and how we can help all of you in the short term. And so, so there is a dilemma. Uh, you have to build it into your policy planning. You know, you have to force it into the way you think. Uh, and that goes for the international community as well, uh, and for the international, you know, we have to be able to look at 2030 and 2050, being politicians. Uh, 
And, and, and that's a decision we need to take together. And I think we've taken it in Denmark, and that's why we are coming out with a number of favorable reforms that have done so for the past 20 years that actually builds a solid economy and decent employment still, although there are 6% unemployed people in Denmark. But it is definitely a dilemma, and uh, I guess uh, uh, even more internationally and even more dealing with sustainable uh, development and sustainable growth where there are a number of factors working against the long-term planning, the investments for uh, the longer perspective uh, and, and the policies, they may hurt you in the short term, but benefit you tremendously in the longer one. Uh. Look, you're a politician, so you're obviously a communicator. You've been a journalist. Is this a communication issue, do you think? Because it seems to me that the world these days is very short-term. Business is, politics is, you know, everybody wants something now mm. is this something that you think as a as a minister is part of your mandate to actually communicate obviously you want to focus on stuff you can do but is it important for you to actually not just communicate with your constituents in terms of your voters but perhaps the people you deal with in other countries to get everybody to recognize the importance not just of looking at the short term but of looking at how things will actually develop well you have to build it into the way you do planning as well, and and the way you measure, and the way you, uh, uh, yeah, the way you you measure as well. Uh, simple things like you know uh, having a too high discount rate uh, is gonna of course take you to the short term instead of the long uh, term. Uh, we are working on solving that problem in Denmark, making sure that our measure of growth incorporates. Uh, natural capital and, and revenue flows that comes from natural capital is a way of ensuring that we measure in a manner that allows us for long-term planning and not only the short-term perspective. Uh, uh, so you can do a lot in communication and, in, and by, by, as you say, or by, by building incentives into your planning cycle that forces you to think longer uh, term. And, and we haven't done that uh, for sure. Uh, and. Uh, of course, demographic transitions like those we see in the world and the World Bank report on the future need for employment creation. Scary. Scary. And that definitely should be built into our policy perspectives, you know, so that we really have a long-term planning for job creation uh, that meets the demographic transition that's going to put pressure on all of us and will create tremendous instability in the world if we don't do it. And how do we measure that instability in the future up against short-term gains in terms of uh, creating uh, uh, growth right now? You know, that's a big challenge for us, and I hope uh, research will tell us how to do it. As, as, as Martin said, there is no silver bullet, but um, at least that means you can't hold the gun to your head. Uh, sorry, that was a joke. Um, Ole Rasmussen, and sorry, Ole, I think I mispronounced your name. No, that's just perfectly fine. Um, <laughs> So my name is Ole Rasmussen. I work <laughs> for Dan, Dan Church, it's a Danish NGO, and then I'm also a PhD student. So I have a question for uh, Mr. Christian Friesbach uh, concerning the intersection between research and, and practice. Um, so we heard earlier uh, Morten say, uh, say that uh, he would like more um, evidence-based uh, development policy. And I think, if I was not mistaken, that Johnny actually said it was helpful to have uh, a researcher next to him at some point, um, I think it was in, in Mozambique. So you also said that you like, you like to support uh, this type of, of interaction. It, it occurs to me that there's a lot of research and development going on in, in Denmark. Certainly there's a lot of policy, but very often in two very different spheres. And, and step number one for more evidence-based uh, policy must be to have these people to meet. And I think this is one, one, one occasion where they meet. So my question to you is, do you plan other such initiatives where you force practitioners and, and researchers uh, to meet on, on development issues? Thank you. <laughs> force them, I don't think it's a good... Uh, <laughs> no, I think what he means by force is the fact that we're in the room and everybody's communicating does yeah. mean you have to answer his question. I hope most of you came voluntarily. Uh, and... <laughs> and uh, uh, and that's the way to go about it. And I think uh, I think that has to be. We need to inspire each other. And and I can't say I have a quick fix for how to do it. But but um, I think in in, the, in if you go back just ten years, there was a much more kind of division between 
those who dealt with development practice uh, and they were kind of development practitioners and, and had knowledge that had to do with how did you do development. And then you had kind of those who knew stuff about energy or water or health uh, researchers uh, over here. Today, I see it coming much more together. Uh, and a lot of the research that we want to uh, finance now is not research that's done in, 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 in isolation from the core. For instance, take health. We support a lot of health research with international dimensions, but it's done in a research environment where they do research on Danish health uh, problems at the same time and try to have those interlinkages. I think we see a globalization uh, of research environments uh, and they will inspire us all along the chain from Denmark uh, to Mozambique, uh, hopefully, and thereby uh, bringing in a much closer uh, relationship between researchers and development uh, uh, practitioners in, in, in the future. I think that's the way uh, uh, to go in many ways. We still have a need for core development research as Recom, and this audience is very much also uh, an example uh, of. But we also need to have a much closer kind of to globalize our research institutions. And don't, because if you want to do water efficiency, you know, you can learn from what we did in Denmark and you can use it, uh, some of it at least in, in, uh, in, in, in Mozambique uh, or in Ethiopia. And, and that link between strong research environments with a global outreach, I think, can bridge uh, the, the knowledge gap that you talk okay. about. I'm going to jump in here for a moment because I have a simple observation to make, is that earlier in the day, whenever we had an ability for the panel to join the audience to press their little green buttons to ask a question, they were usually among the top five. And suddenly, they've gone quiet. <laughs> so, gentlemen, Madam, our one woman, thank you, Karen, for being up there. Don't forget, you two can push your button, um, and mine. Rasmus Lud Ludvigsen. Rasmus, where are you? Yep. Hello. Uh, very good pronunciation, thank you. Um, I would just like to ask, um, because it's been mentioned here before, uh, sometimes during today, the, about industrial policy uh, and developing countries or governments of developing countries to be specific about choosing specific sectors to focus on and so on. I would like to ask you, because I know, as you said, you mentioned yourself, you're a trade economist and so on, and in that field, ideas about comparative advantages and so on have been very fashionable, and they sort of sometimes go against the idea of industrial policy because, you know, right now, developing countries might not have uh, advantages in, 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 in sectors other than, for example, agriculture and so on. And We've been talking about uh, the need for economic transformation. So I'd like to ask you, what is your position on uh, developing countries sort of focusing uh, their, their budgets or what you can say on specific sectors and choosing winners, as some like to call it? Um, what is your position on that? Well, I think I need some help from the panel probably here, uh, but I, I don't think Choosing winners is, is necessarily an, an easy thing to do or the right track to take. Um, conducive business environments are, are, cru are crucial. Uh, I know uh, I've been a big fan of Paul Krugman and the geographies of trade uh, and, and his uh, issues with the, uh, promoting an industrial policy where you try uh, to, uh, to build uh, those uh, clusters that can then uh, give you a competitive advantage uh, because uh, you have a certain, you built the Silicon Valley or the medical valley that we try to build in this region or whatever valley you try to construct by targeted industrial policy. I think Krugman's conclusion of all that is in any case, uh, you know, if you try to do it, uh, you won't be the only one. Uh, and uh, that's the one uh, warning sign. And if everybody does it, there are no advantages to doing it whatsoever. Uh, so I, I still think it, it, that is, I don't think it's the right approach uh, to take for many developing countries. And also because they simply do not have the means to do so. They don't have the means to promote an aggressive industrial policy in picking winners and, and doing everything from infrastructure and research uh, and, uh, and perhaps even targeted subsidies uh, building business environments. They don't have the means to do it. Uh, and then you can just, it, it's Finish. not going to work for you. Okay, uh, I'm 
I'm going to cut you off briefly because I'd like you to answer a couple more questions and suddenly the panel has gotten a little bit more woken up. But first of all, um, because he was in the queue for a long time, Lars Anderson, Lars Sigurd Anderson. Where are you, Lars? I'm sitting here, but I don't have anything to comment. Pardon? I'm sitting right here, ma'am, but I don't have anything to comment. Okay, sorry, you were on my list. Finn Tarp. <laughs> Thank you very much, Christian, for both a very constructive but also very engaged and sort of optimist way of approaching the kinds of challenges that we are facing. I share that very much and, and, and I commend you for maintaining that. I, I, let me also maybe just say one word about clever politicians. It is that you do what is right, not just what gets you re-elected. But I, I one sort of sort of worry in, in, in discussing uh, results versus knowledge, which I, I wonder whether you would be able to elaborate just a little bit. It's very clear that in, in Recom we are trying to do research and we are trying to communicate, and we are trying to do both, and we are serious about it. But could you sort of elaborate a little bit how you sort of see this results-based management kind of issue, how that sort of relates to this? Because sometimes we get a little bit confused when we're talking about knowledge on the one hand, results on the other, and how that sort of relates to this longer term research process. If you have anything you could add in or kick in, I would appreciate it. If not, we can take it another time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, I, I'm not quite sure I see the dilemma. I, <laughs> I hope uh, all of you create knowledge and <laughs> I trust that it's going to give us better results. Uh, uh, so so I, I, I'm not quite sure, but I see the dilemma as, as clear as, as you might. But, but uh, obviously, I'm a, I'm a great fan of free research, you know, and I think the university policy that we are promoting now is giving universities more leverage in planning and doing their own research in a, in a manner that makes sense. And uh, because I think if we put, having been at a university for quite some years also myself, if we put everything into small uh, pockets and uh, and uh, competitive research schemes that are have we the freedom of researchers and the impact of research is, is probably gonna diminish in the long term that's my fear at least uh, um, but but on the other hand I guess the recom is a very targeted exercise right uh, results with a, with a clear focus on promoting and analyzing uh, the results uh, of uh, uh, development uh, impacts uh, or uh, interventions and and there I guess uh, what I've seen and what I've heard and what I've learned I think has given us good insight uh, on the macroeconomic level on the micro interventions uh, on how we can do better and I think that's what we needed so I would thank you all for that and uh, two more quick questions and then I know you need to escape Tetsushi thank you uh, in this morning, uh, everybody in this room participated in an uh, opinion survey using this machine. And then it turned out that uh, uh, people here have very strong concern about uh, uh, governance and corruption in developing countries. So I'd like to know if the, your organization has any good ideas about how to uh, reduce corruption in developing countries and how to improve the governance there. How to induce corruption? In, in, no, no, oh, reduce. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, the brown I'll paper envelope's waiting outside. I hope, uh, <laughs> yeah, okay, I think I understand the question. Uh, now, uh, I'm a big fan of what you can call, uh, well, social accountability, you know. I think the only way in the long run to combat corruption is by allowing people themselves to keep an eye on what your government is doing, and that's key to a rights-based approach. Uh, I, I've seen so many good examples of how it can be done uh, around in the world, where you buy transparency in budgeting, transparency in revenue flows, transparency in funding mechanisms, and then an active engagement by everything from an ombudsman or a state auditors, a civil society, the free press. That's how you can do something about corruption. And I'm a transparency freak uh, in terms of that. Uh, and I think that is absolutely essential. We can never ever, and we have made that mistake may too many times, uh, try to control every single penny spent out of uh, Copenhagen. Uh, we can't do it, and uh, sending out our auditors is probably never going to make the, it's never going to make the trick anyway. But if we can build out that 
kind of uh, transparency and social accountability uh, in individual countries. That makes a lot of a difference. And I've seen it so many places and that's the long term. And that's why we actually, sometimes I would even argue for loosening our ties on the funding. If we can insist on transparency, strengthening financial flows or financial management, then I would loosen my tie and even be willing to risk, risk a corruption scandal somewhere in the world if it can really re uh, lead to a longer term uh, uh, promotion of those structures within a society that eventually can lead to decent financial management in the longer term. One quick anecdote before I give Martin the microphone, or he's got his own microphone, but give Martin the floor. There was a story of development aid which was going astray and it was on a very micro level, so in a village. So what they started doing was putting up signs saying, we have given X amount of dollars to. Mm. <laughs> Where have you seen the results? And that created a lot of accountability rather quickly, actually. Martin Rama. I had a, <coughs> in fact, this is a more a comment than, than a question I wanted, and it goes very much in the uh, direction of your response on the issue of industrial policy, which is one that uh, we try to face in the World Development Report on jobs. So every chapter finishes with what we call a difficult question. There is a chapter that basically makes the point that the jobs challenges are very different across countries, and so the question is, should we go for a targeted investment climate? And the immediate answer was, well, is that industrial policy? And that's one possible reaction. When we think about targeting policies, we tend to think about sectors, narrowly defined sectors and picking winners. On the other hand, we all tend to agree with ideas like supporting the participation of women in paid employment, supporting the development of competitive cities, or uh, supporting small and medium enterprises, which are forms of targeting. In one case, it's by gender, in one case, it's by location, in one case, is by size, not by sector. And so we came up with a response that was very much along the, the lines of what the minister said, is if you know what your job's challenge is, and there are clear things that you can do to remove the constraints, like getting more women into paid work, one. And two, there is no risk of the policy being captured by narrow interest groups, then go ahead. But a lot of the narrowly defined industrial policies don't, don't pass that test. Okay, Gary Fields. I thought, I thought we weren't having any more. Well, he's not answering because it was a comment, so I'm yeah, okay. more sliding comments. you right. <laughs> More comments okay. would be... Uh, I, I, I want to put you on the spot, if I may, hmm? and that is that uh, one of the, th the things that I like to push for myself is to have a single well-defined objective um, above all else. And um, one I put forth this morning when I spoke was uh, uh, jobs to reduce poverty. And I heard... Uh, uh, you make a num number of other comments, green growth, uh, decent employment, sustainable development, um, uh, rights-based approaches and things. My, my, so my question to you is, if you could uh, target one of those goals uh, above all others, what would be the one that you would target? <laughs> one goal? <laughs> <laughs> well... well um, Sustainable growth, but but again, it's a it's a broad term. I don't think you can pick a, a specific goal and see it in isolation. For instance, now let's let's say I'm I've just come from the Global Green Growth uh, Forum, and there we discussed now uh, how uh, can you really create a green growth uh, pattern. Now, if you want to do that in a country like Nigeria, one of the things to do is definitely to get rid of fossil fuel subsidies in Nigeria. Now, how do you get rid of fossil fuel subsidies in Nigeria? If you do it like that, get your energy subsidies. If you do it like that, you're going to get public riot and, uh, and uh, people will go to the streets and th throw you out immediately. So you have then to look at building social welfare schemes in the first place. Uh, you have to engage in making sure that there is some kind of social safety net. It can be social uh, conditional cash transfers or pension schemes or health schemes and then if you build such a structure, then you can perhaps get rid of your fuel subsidies. Uh, and you have to see that in coordination. And the World Bank has done uh, good work on it, actually, and shown that if you really do it correctly, you can create social safety nets with the same poverty impact as energy or food uh, uh, subsidies for one-fifth of the price. Uh, so every economic argument is there, but you have to see it in coordination. There's, that's why an inclusive 
green economy. That's the goal, you know. Uh, but it's you have to see the multi that you can't say which a specific policy is where to go or a specific intervention is, is going to solve it. It has to be seen in, it, in its entirety. And inclusive green growth is, is I guess, what's, uh, what our key policy uh, target uh, is in our, our, in our strategy. Do you have time for one more? I think so. Henrik Nielsen. No, you guys push the button Thank you. literally at the same time. I'm here. I'm here. Hello. Wait. Uh, I would I'm like blind. To like hi. Ah, hi. Hi. Yes, sorry, <laughs> Henrik, you were there. Before. I'm from the Danish NGO Forum. Uh, our members are facing uh, new demands when it comes to results-based management and effectiveness, and we don't have many problems with that because uh, we think we are quite good at what we are doing so far. My problem is that when you look at the, the Danita uh, programs within. Uh, uh, job creation and growth uh, results, according to your own evaluations, are much more mixed. Uh, are you going to set up these results-based allocation mechanisms for the jobs and uh, employment programs in the future as well? Uh, that's my question. Yes, I, I, I think we will increasingly focus and try to look, and I hope uh, that Recom will help identify where we can, with our interventions, create jobs uh, and where we can do it in an uh, efficient uh, manner. And I think results matters just as much there. I think in many ways we've been in a transition and I, I totally agree with you that many of the kind of interventions that have been targeted towards creating jobs at a firm level, many of them have not been successful. Uh, many of them have failed. Uh, many of them have also gone quite well, and I've seen it. Uh, but you must also admit that if you look at the past 10 years, well, five years ago, the business environment in many African countries was far from where it is today. Uh, uh, the conducive environment that under which these programs perform uh, have improved a lot in many countries, and I do hope and expect uh, that we will see better results from these more targeted uh, business partnership uh, interventions. But they should be uh, scrutinized just as any other uh, program that we have. I totally agree with you and we have actually started a small exercise to look a little bit more uh, focused on uh, whether we achieve the results that we, uh, we should in this sector uh, as well. Um, because definitely uh, it is not. Uh, it, it should live up to the same uh, criteria uh, that uh, any other intervention uh, should. And I hope the research here can tell us more about: Is it if you do those micro-level interventions on the firm level? You know, what are the conditions upon which you will achieve success? You know, well, your evaluation report should be helping with that information too, right? It, it should for yeah. sure. Okay. Well, we're going to start now, actually, doing a little bit of a wrap-up. Um, and we hope you'll take part a little bit, but I understand at some point you might have to sneak out. So, in fact, I see somebody over there yeah. panicking, like, yes, yes. I'm very sorry, but it was inspiring to be here, and I will definitely look into the results. I will uh, bring in my research gene again and uh, dive into some of the results, Great. and I've done so already. And I thank you all for the inspiration you've given us today here, and, uh, and look forward to the continued partnership. So thank, thank you very, you very much, much for joining us. Thanks.